in Vancouver, um, and I couldn't be more thrilled to be here. Uh, I first want to acknowledge that we, with great gratitude, that we are here on unceded Algonquin territory. I want to thank the organizers of this event, uh, especially uh, Brigitte de Pop for inviting me and for her incredible courage uh, and being such an inspiring young woman. And are unbelievable. I mean, unbelievable. We um, I've ne I don't think I've ever been to such a, not just a well-organized conference, but just a lovingly organized conference. People are just so considerate and so warm, and that bodes so well for the kind of movements that we need to build. We need to take care of each other, and you are taking such wonderful care of us. Um, as you heard from, from, from Bill, <laughs> the wonderful Bill McKibben, um, I, I had a baby recently. Um, I, I, I came to it late in the game, this motherhood thing. Um, Tomo was born in June on the banks of the Salish Sea in British Columbia on the Sunshine Coast. And I wanted him to be born there because that's a part of the world I'm very attached to. My family lives there and I've been visiting there for 20 years and living there on and off. And um, and I wanted him to be connected to that place. And one of the things that's so wonderful about the movement against the, the, the tankers and the pipelines on the West Coast is that it is so driven by love. It is a movement that, is a, that, that has made people fall more in love with where they live in articulating why we will not let it be destroyed. Um, so just to give you a, a, an idea of what it was like to, to have a baby on the Sunshine Coast, um, you know, it's tough. It, it, you know, any new parent will complain about being sleepless, and you know, I, I certainly um, am, am sleep deprived, and will ask you to bear with me. And it's good that we have these sound effects here. <laughs> um, uh, in July, Toma was, I think, three weeks old. Uh, Abby and I were up at 5 a.m. for probably the fifth feed of the night. We were completely exhausted, feeling very sorry for ourselves, and um, and. It, a little bit of pink was coming through the, the, the window blinds, and Ubby, in a, in a fit of life affirmation, opened the blinds. It's like, we, we, we can't sleep, but at least we can enjoy the sunrise. So we opened the blinds, and Ubby looked out and said, holy shit. And we, we're on the water. We're lucky enough to be on the water. And, and, and outside in the bay were two towering black dorsal fins, of, um, two orcas. And we went out on the porch, um, with Toma, and we saw two more orcas leaping through the air, clearing the water to meet the others. And it was a family. They were feeding too. Um, maybe on <laughs> seals. <laughs> <laughs> Toma's not on solids yet. Um, and, and we just watched, just mesmerized. And it was, it was particularly thrilling because I, I had never seen an orca outside of marine land <laughs> when I was a kid. <laughs> Um, and I'd actually never heard of orcas in that part of the Sunshine Coast, and never so close to shore. So something, it felt like, it felt like a miracle. It felt like these whales were coming to greet our son. It felt like, you know, he had woken us just so that we wouldn't miss them. And they were gone by 6 a.m. You know, see, if we had slept, we would have completely missed them. Um, there are benefits to sleeplessness. So, so this is a beautiful story, and, and I, I'm very attached to the story, and I see it as being really a part of you know, the story of my son's life. Um, but something happened a couple of weeks ago that made me rethink it in a way that I'm really troubled by. Um, so what happened is that um, I read in the newspaper, actually in the Guardian newspaper, a story by our own Martin Lukacs, who um, wrote that story. Um, that there had been the, quote, world's biggest geoengineering experiment 
um, off the islands of Haida Gwaii, uh, several hundred miles north of where, of where we were on the Sunshine Coast. And what had happened is that uh, this would-be geoengineer named Russ George and his crew had dumped 100 tons of iron dust off the side of a rented fishing boat in the hopes of creating an algae bloom. And there was a twofold goal here. One was to, uh, to su supposedly to bring back the salmon. That's what was promised to the community, that if you create a phytoplankton bloom, then it'll bring zooplankton and all kinds of other creatures that salmon like to eat. Um, and then the salmon will be back. Uh, it was, I think, exploiting people's desperation, um, and, 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 and they were also told that they would get carbon credits for this because ocean fertilization is one of the top so-called geoengineering fixes that is, they're often touted because if you, if, you, if you fertilize the ocean and you have a big algae bloom, algae soaks up carbon just like any plant does, um, and that, and there are people out there who want to be paid money for sequestering carbon in algae because supposedly they'll sink to the bottom of the ocean and be sequestered there. There's a big debate about whether it really will stay there. Um, but uh, I'll, I'll, I'll tell you why this relates to the, the whales in a, in a minute because they actually claim that they did create a huge algae bloom, half the size of the state of Massachusetts, 10,000 kilometers, uh, uh, and that there was a riot of sea life that came to feed off of the phytoplankton. And they brag that where you used to see, you know, maybe five whales a week in this part of the world, now the whales could be counted by the score. And I read this and I thought, wow, you know, those whales I saw were swimming north. Um, it was July, right, when this experiment was going on. I mean, is it so crazy to think that maybe they were on their way? <laughs> um, and so this, this event that I had seen as incredibly beautiful and natural it was suddenly recast as something vaguely sinister. And this is just one example of the way that geoengineering, which is increasingly being taken seriously as a solution to climate change because we have failed so spectacularly to embrace real solutions to climate change, which involve getting off fossil fuels. Um, these, once we start tampering with the oceans, fertilizing the oceans, or trying to block the sun with sulfur in the stratosphere, or brightening the clouds, um, we, uh, we will never view nature in the same way. You know, Bill McKibben wrote a book in 1988 called The End of Nature. And, I, and what we will face if we go down this road is, is something even more terrifying, which is the end of miracles, the end of the idea that there are these incredible random acts that we can't explain that come to us as gifts. We'll always see these strings being pulled behind the scenes. Um, so I just wanted to start with that story because I think the fact that geoengineering um, is being taken seriously, despite the enormous risks, uh, you know, ocean fertilization, it may not sequester carbon, but it could well create dead zones in the ocean, uh, toxic tides, more ocean acidification, um, and the other techniques, uh, blocking the sun through, through sulfur in the stratosphere. You, know, you can imagine a scenario where North America would decide to do that to save their corn crops. Um, and the effect of that, according to many of the computer models that have been done, would be that it would interfere with the Asian and African summer monsoons, and it would uh, put at risk the food supply for billions of people.